Welcome everyone to the 2020 State of the City Address with Mayor Stephen Scharf. I'm City Manager Deb Fang, for those folks that don't know me, and I'm really happy to see everybody here. As you can see with the Mayor's gifts, including the reusable utensils and water bottles, sustainability is a theme for tonight's event. This is an issue that's near and dear to our Mayor's heart and our core focus of the city. Please make sure to grab the utensils and water bottles at the merchandise table, staffed by the mayor's intern, Ms. Juliet Sharon. Also, the centerpieces at your tables are low water succulents, which we encourage you to take home and plant in your yards. <clears throat> that was popular. <laughs> I know. We're lucky enough to have quite a few VIPs in the room, so you'll forgive me for not naming everybody, but we do notice you and we totally appreciate you being here. Um, so I wanna thank you for that. Um, and with that, I would encourage you all to stick around after the mayor's address and discuss the topics he, that he brings up tonight in addition to any topic of interest for you. Now, please let, welcome me, help me welcome Mr. Mayor Stephen Scharf to the podium. Thank you. So good evening. So this photo was taken a couple of weeks ago right outside City Hall, a beautiful rainbow that we arranged. And hopefully every, everyone saw that. So the city of Cupertino, it continues to be a great place to live. In fact, in one index we saw, we moved up from number 14 to number nine last year. And I wish I could take all the credit for that, but it probably wasn't just me. It was our whole city staff and all of the people in the city that did that. Few cities have our weather, our great public works department with our top rated road quality, top notch public schools, parks and recreation opportunities, the close by green belt, green belt the wonderful library, and our low levels of violent crime. So I like to call Cupertino the brain of Silicon Valley, because San Jose calls itself the capital of Silicon Valley, even though there were really no semiconductor fabs there. Sunnyvale calls itself the heart of Silicon Valley, Milpitas the gateway of Silicon Valley. So I think we should claim the brain before some other city takes it, because there's uh, a limited number of body parts available. So I wanted to grade ourselves on last year's goals uh, based on last year's state of the city that I set forward. We did pretty well. There's always room for improvement. But we did a lot of the things that we set forth to do, including fixing our general plan inconsistencies. And I won't read all of these, but that was a key thing, that it was very time sensitive to fix our general plan before December 31st, 2019. We did the code of ethics. Uh, and we were working with local and state organizations uh, about local control. Uh, we launched the VIA shuttle. We are working on housing for the developmentally disabled and funding of the library program room. So the goals for 2020, we want to work on our sustainability issues, including the green building code, uh, look at a single use foodware ordinance, and transportation improvements. Uh, we also want to address the library parking issue, and, and that will be a requirement with the new program room because there are minimum parking requirements based on how many people are in a public building. We want to implement the park master plan, continue working on affordable housing, and continue to oppose anti-affordable housing legislation. And a couple of hours ago, or maybe less than that, in Sacramento, uh, Senate Bill 50, which most cities in the state have opposed because of the harm it would cause, did go down to defeat in the state Senate by three votes, although it will probably be brought back later in the week, maybe with amendments to try, try to get it to pass. So we're crossing our fingers that it does not pass, uh, but we still have to be vigilant. So I also wanted to take this opportunity to lavish praise on our new city manager, Deb Fong. 
So Deb has been such a breath of fresh air for Cupertino. She's just what our city council and city needed. She doesn't sit in her office all day. She's out there advocating for the city throughout the region and the state. In fact, yesterday she was in Sacramento working with our lobbying firm, trying to secure funding for some affordable housing. And Deb grew up in Cupertino and she graduated from Monta Vista High School. And this is her yearbook picture right here. <laughs> she looks exactly the same. And you'll notice 2019 to 2039. So that's, we're expecting her to be here at least until 2039. So that's only uh, 19 more years. So sustainability. Last week, our city council passed our REACH code, and it's one of many steps we need to take to become a more sustainable city. In the next year, we'll be working on additional sustainability initiatives, including standards for more ener energy efficient new buildings. Also part of sustainability is following the example of our neighboring cities and improving our bike ped infrastructure uh, looking into the possibility of an ordinance to reduce plastic waste. We also launched our VIA Shuttle. We funded an 18-month trial of the VIA Shuttle. This program quickly became extremely popular. And it also coincided <laughs> with the loss of one of our VTA bus routes, the 81 line. I may be one of the only people that ever used it to go to the airport. Uh, and we'd love to expand the destinations reachable by the shuttle to include places like the Santa Clara Caltrain Station, additional medical facilities besides, we go to Kaiser now, uh, but we might want to go to Palo Alto Medical Clinic in Sunnyvale, and maybe a VTA light rail station. And we've been talking to other West Valley cities like Saratoga and Campbell, and they're also interested in this kind of thing and may even partner with us and we could expand the service. And I figure we need to come up with a good slogan for VIA. And so I, I tried one, a transportation solution that actually does move you. <laughs> if you're familiar with the VTA slogan, solutions that move you, which doesn't sound so great. <laughs> well, it sounds like something you'd buy at the drugstore. Anyway. <laughs> so we'll need to seek grant funding. So we funded this for 18 months. Uh, we cannot fund it indefinitely, so we'll need grant funding to expand the service. I know in Mountain View, Google funds their community shuttle. Um, is Rod Deardon here today? <laughs> I guess not. Okay, so yeah, maybe we can find some company in Cupertino to help us fund that as well. So on to IT. So smart city is a big goal and I've involved with our IT department and our chief technology officer. Is Bill Mitchell here? Bill, stand up. So Bill and our technology commission, they're awesome. I mean, they're scary smart. Uh, I go to meetings with them and some cloud vendors and it's really amazing. And smart city, it's not just solving traffic issues. We want to put in sensors for things like airplane noise and air quality, especially no, in known problem areas. So I serve on one of the airport noise uh, roundtables, and you may be shocked that when we ask the FAA, you know, what do you know about noise in the areas in our cities? And they go, we do not monitor noise. If you want noise monitoring, you have to do it yourself. So some, I think Sunnyvale's already setting that up, and we probably want to do the same thing. And smart cities heavily dependent on the deployment of 5G technology uh, because of the higher uh, data capacity and the lower latency. So we've also come up with some really cool technology for getting around Cupertino. If you don't want to bike and don't want to drive, um, well, let, let's just show you the video. It's in the test phase and it seems to be working well. So can we roll that video? Traffic congestion has been a big concern of the residents of Cupertino. We can't continue everyone driving everywhere, so our IT department has been working with leading scientists to come up with new methods for our residents to get around Cupertino. We're almost done with this technology, 
and we're ready to demonstrate it here today. So if everyone's ready, watch carefully. That was great. I have a meeting over at Quinlan, so the system seems to be working fine. I think afterwards I'll go and look at the exhibit at the Historical Museum before I go on to my, my next stop. Well, that was a good visit to Quinlan Center. Now I'm ready to go over to Main Street to get some lunch and some dessert and of course some boba. Great, here I am at Main Street and I'm ready to enjoy some great food, some desserts, and of course, boba. Maybe I'll do some shopping at Target or at AT&T before I go on to my next stop. Well, that was a great meal and boba and dessert over here at Main Street. I think now I'm ready to go over to our world famous library and pick up the materials that I have on reserve. I guess there's still a few bugs in the system, but don't worry, we're working them out. Within a few months, the system will be available to all of our brave residents. So someone did ask me if it will work to transport to other countries, like Copertino, Italy, and we're not sure of that yet, but um, we're, we're working on it. You'll still need a passport, even if you use the transporter, though. Okay, moving on. Our public works department is Roger Lee here. I think I saw him. Roger is our director of public works. They've been working diligently on several issues. Our pavement condition index, when I started in this job, I didn't know what PCI was, and now, now I know a lot about it. And it's one of the best in the Bay Area. We're at 85 out of 100, which is extremely high. Um, very few other cities in the region have a pavement condition index that good. So if your street needs paving, just call Roger. He'll, he'll come out pretty quickly and get that done. Another thing Public Works has been working on is moving forward on the Regnart Creek Trail, which was unanimous, unanimously approved by the City Council last year. And this trail will be one factor in reducing parking demand at the library by allowing easier access by cyclists and pedestrians. Now the other day I woke up and on my phone I saw this notification. The first snow of 2020 expected to hit hard in Cupertino. I immediately forwarded this to Roger Lee and he outfitted some of the city's trucks with snow plows and the snow was cleared before many residents even woke up and realized that we had experienced a blizzard. So was anyone here inconvenienced by the snowstorm? See? Good job, Roger. So housing is a big issue. Cupertino currently has one of the best jobs to housing ratios of any Bay Area jobs rich city because we're not building massive amounts of new commercial office space without commensurate amounts of housing. The, the state has a goal of about one new housing unit for every 1.5 new jobs. And if all of our RENA, regional housing needs allocation entitlements, were actually built, we would meet and exceed that goal. Uh, some of our neighboring cities, unfortunately, are not being as responsible as Cupertino and have approved new projects with extremely unbalanced jobs to housing ratios. Uh, one project uh, in San Jose is adding 23 jobs for every new housing unit. Uh, another one in a neighboring city is at nine to one, one is at four to one. So this kind of imbalance is not sustainable and it impacts all of us with additional traffic, housing insecurity and homelessness because people can't live close to their jobs if there's all these new jobs and not housing to go with it. Now, as a city, we do lose out financially by not worsening our jobs to housing ratio because commercial office space generates significant revenue for the city, but we think still it's the right thing to do. We're also one of the most densely populated cities in the Bay Area for the amount of land we have, and maintaining the quality of life is a constant challenge. 
The state has been taking housing into its own hands and unfortunately, poorly crafted laws often end up hurting the people that they purport to help. And these bills will worsen the quality of life for all residents, they'll worsen income inequality, and they'll exacerbate the affordable housing crisis. Uh, about an hour ago or so, two hours ago, um, there was news from Sacramento that Senate Bill 50, which the city has opposed in most cities in California, including San Francisco and Los Angeles, large and small cities have opposed SB 50, and it did lose in the Senate about an hour ago by three votes, which is great news, except um, the proponents will not give up, and this bill is likely to come back either slightly amended or in a new form next year. So we have to be ever vigilant. Um, so I did mention about RENA, and we, we entitled all of our RENA projects for this cycle, but they're not being built. We had, well, it takes a long time to make progress. There's external factors that are a cause of this issue. I talked to three developers in the past few months regarding projects they have planned in Cupertino and in surrounding cities. And they all told us the reasons, essentially the same reasons of why the building is not starting. The construction costs are too high. There's a shortage of construction workers because of all the commercial office building construction. The material costs have gone up because of uh, the tariffs imposed by President Trump. And also the rental housing market is softening and rents are coming down slowly, but they're coming down in Cupertino and other cities. So the issue is we have a lot, we have way too much high cost luxury rental housing, but there's a shortage of moderate and affordable housing. There's also a shortage of for sale housing. Um, I know the developers have fears of a recession. Uh, they don't like the mitigation fees that cities charge for things like parks and the school districts charge for schools saying they're too high, even though the reality is that these mitigation fees are at levels that are far below what's necessary to recover the costs incurred by a city or, or a school district. So the good news is corporations are beginning to step up to the plate to fund affordable housing. You may have heard last year, Apple announced a $2.5 billion contribution towards housing and other companies like Kaiser and Facebook and Microsoft are also beginning to help fund new affordable housing. In Cupertino, one of the projects that did get completed was the veranda. So the veranda is an 100% affordable housing project. It was finished and fully occupied in 18 months. It was a great accomplishment, but it's only 19 affordable units out of the 1,400 plus housing units the city has zoned for in our current RENA cycle. Uh, the city's approved 807 units, including 74 affordable units on other priority housing sites, and that, that's not including the housing at Valco. Uh, the problem is we need those projects to actually move forward. Uh, the veranda is the only units that have been built. So when a project doesn't get built, if it has 1,000 units and, a, and 100 affordable units, we don't get those affordable units, and that's the housing that we really need. On another positive note, the city is working with nonprofits to try to build some extremely low-income housing for the developmentally disabled on some city-owned project along Mary Avenue. And is Oren Mahoney here today? Yep. Yay, Oren. So Oren is helping to spearhead that project uh, with Rotary. And like many things, and you don't realize this sometimes until you get into office, everything takes a really long time. It's a slow process, but we are making progress. So The Atlantic recently had an article regarding empty housing in Manhattan, but it's not a problem unique to New York City. The Mercury News recently reported that there are tens of thousands of empty housing units in the Bay Area as well. We, when we have so many housing units, but we have full homeless shelters, something's wrong with our housing policy. And you may have seen what occurred in Oakland recently with the, uh, I think it was called Moms for Housing, occupying a house in Oakland. And eventually, 
the property owner did agree to sell it to them, which is good news. Uh, but it's too bad it's so difficult. So blue lining is a new kind of housing discrimination practice. In the past, it was called redlining, where banks would not loan to low-income minority neighborhoods. They wouldn't loan for mortgages or home improvement loans. But now something equally harmful is called blue lining. So this is the transformation of those same neighborhoods by displacement and gentrification. And we're seeing this in places like San Francisco and San Jose in a very big way, where there's a neighborhood and somebody wants to build something really nice and expensive, but it's displacing the existing residents uh, that will have to move even further away in order to have housing and will commute even more back to where the jobs are. And that's one thing that SB 50 uh, would have caused and will cause if it passes. So housing legislation. So last year, our senator, Jim Bell, for our district, he introduced SB 5. So SB 5 was a bill that would have made significant impact in terms of funding affordable housing. Um, unfortunately, SB 5 was vetoed by Governor Gavin Newsom, saying that um, while it was a good idea, he didn't want to use general fund money in order to build affordable housing. So the state is kind of saying, yes, you guys got to build more housing and more affordable housing, and we're, we, you got to solve homelessness, but no, we're not going to give you any money to do it. And uh, Senator Bell is reintroducing this legislation in the current session. So addressing the affordable housing crisis, it takes a lot of money. Uh, Senator Bell understands this. Uh, but legislation that attacks cities for things beyond their control is not going to solve anything. So earlier today, I was at a meeting in Mountain View of the uh, California League of Cities, and they had a slide up there that showed how many RENA units have been permitted, where cities have issued building permits. So the scorecard's pretty bad, but the thing is, we have not denied building permits. It's when we get, give arena entitlement, the property owner has to actually get the project approved, and we've done approvals, and then they have to come and ask for a permit. So it's not a good metric. It makes it sound like the cities are denying the permit for this housing, which is not the case. Um, so I did talk about SB 50. Um, when, I, when I wrote this, I didn't know what was going to happen today. Um, the League of California Cities has opposed it, um, as have many cities. It would provide less funding for our schools. Uh, so hopefully bad bills won't come back, but you never can tell. Uh, also last year, um, AB, sorry, I'm a little behind on the slide, AB 1482. This was a bill by David Chu of San Francisco, assembly person, that it imposed a rent cap of 5% plus the um, consumer price index, and it also imposed uh, evic eviction restrictions. Unfortunately, the eviction restrictions didn't kick in until um, January 1st. So a lot of cities were doing blank, a lot of landlords were doing blanket evictions to get rid of all the tenants before January 1st so they could raise the rents. Uh, so Cupertino, being responsible like many other cities, we rushed, we passed an emergency ordinance to try to prevent these evictions. Uh, but it took so long to, before we realized what was happening, it was really symbolic what we did. But a lot of cities passed these. We don't know if it prevented any evictions, but we thought we should be doing that. Uh, we don't know how many people were displaced. Uh, AB 1482 will also have another unintended consequence because of the rent, the rent cap is about 7.5%, but actually in the Bay Area, there are no cities where rents have been going up by 7.5% a year. You occasionally get something in the news with a huge rent increase of 50%, but that's, that's not the norm. And generally, landlords respond to the market, and Cupertino rents have come down slightly. Um, 
Other cities, they've gone up or down slightly, but nowhere have they gone up that much. So some happier things. On a happier topic, our library continues to be the jewel in the county library system. And recently, I was coming to City Hall about 9.45 a.m. I saw this big crowd of people out in the plaza, and I thought it was like some kind of a protest that I had done something wrong. And I asked what it was, and they said, no, 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 we're just waiting for the library to open. We, we want to be the first ones in. <laughs> so the library is overcrowded. And what the city did, we funded uh, the construction of a new program room at the library. And we're hoping to build, begin construction later this year and complete construction in 2021. We've been hoping to get the funding as part of the community benefits um, from a project, the Hamptons. But since that project has been on hold, we decided this is one time it's worthwhile to dip into our reserves to fund this project. And I did mention parking because the program room will increase the need for parking. <laughs> so I saw this the other day. I didn't think this was an acceptable solution for parking. We are going to have to have a parking management plan that takes into account the increased capacity. And this solution is not practical. We are going to have to come up with something better. Um, so there are a few things. Um, parking garages and underground parking are enormously expensive. I believe an underground garage is about $80,000 per parking space. We don't have the funds to do that sort of thing. So we're going to have to find other ways to address this issue, uh, including some or all of the following. Increasing the hours so we can spread out the demand. Uh, I know some people are reluctant to ride their bikes to the library because there's been a number of bike thefts. So we're looking at putting in secure bicycle parking, including lockers uh, or electronic uh, bike parking spaces that you can unlock with your cell phone or a clipper card. Uh, there's also the issue of time limits. I was over at Los Gatos Library for a meeting last week, and I saw the little Cushman vehicle driving around. They strictly enforce a 90-minute time limit for the buildings in their city center, including the library. Uh, we already actually do have parking time limits in our library lot, but we really don't enforce them much, and they're not in effect all the time. So we did form a legislative action committee this year. Uh, it's me and council member Liang Chow. We've been extremely engaged with our lobbying firm, Townsend and Associates in Sacramento, to craft our legislative platform, with the, which the council passed in the last meeting. And some items in that plan we have a chance of achieving, and some we can only dream of achieving, but we thought we should put them in there anyway, just to show what our views are on those, um, those issues. And last year I was up in Sacramento, and I was talking to one legislative aide of a uh, legislator who remained unnamed, and he explained things to me frankly and said, the cities don't give money to the campaigns of legislators. They don't have as much influence as the corporations or other entities that, that do give money. So that's unfortunate, but until we get public financing of elections, uh, I don't see that changing in any, any beneficial way. So the city, we are financially stable. Um, we have issues. We have legal costs that are increasing. Um, you may be familiar with the embezzlement case, and that is moving forward. We don't have a resolution of that yet, but our city attorney, is she here, Heather? Um, she's all in on that, and we are hopefully going to come to a conclusion later this year. Uh, we have a lot of capital expenditures that we need uh, with buildings that need to be replaced or retrofitted, including our city hall and some of our uh, public works buildings. And like all cities, we face the likelihood of increased employee pension obligations. So we really need to be mindful of our employee headcount and, and be very careful about increasing it because every new employee um, will have pension and health care costs long into the future. Long, long after I'm gone from the council and the, these will come back to haunt future councils. So we need to really be 
responsible. And we have been responsible. We're very, very careful about increasing our headcount. And if there was a recession and a pension crisis, we'd be forced to cut services because we'd have to dip it into our reserves to solve that. And you know, we depend heavily on property tax to fund city services. But unlike in the past when housing costs and housing values were going up double digits every year, that's not happening anymore. We can't continue to count on increased property taxes forever to fund the city. Now, everyone's favorite topic is cement. So the issue with the cement, the issues with the cement plant continue, of course. Um, as most of you know, the cement plant is not inside the city limits of Cupertino, it's in the county. So we have to work with the county and state agencies to address issues of pollution. We were successful, at least temporarily, last year of halting the truck traffic that's, that was going between the Lehigh Quarry and the Stevens Creek Quarry. Uh, and in a few weeks, Supervisor Simidian will hold a forum at Community Hall on the cement plant. I encourage everyone concerned with that to attend his, his forum. So everyone loves our parks, and we are looking to acquire land over uh, near Lawrence Expressway. Um, it's called Lawrence Mitty. And that acquisition has been taking a very long time, but we believe it's moving forward. Hopefully we can close on that property this year and start deciding what we're gonna do with that and what that land is appropriate for. We also have our all-inclusive playground that will be at Jollyman Park. That's gonna go out for bids this year. And our Parks and Rec Master Plan, which the, will come to council soon for approval. Now, Valco, not a day goes by where someone doesn't ask me the question, what's happening with Valco? So what would a state of the city address be without talking about it? Now, I wish we could go back to the 1980s when it was the go-to shopping center in Silicon Valley, but that ship has sailed, it's not coming back. So where are we today? So a lot depends on the outcome of litigation that was brought by an outside organization and other challenges and depending on the outcome of the litigation there is possibilities uh, the property owner could move forward with the SB 35 project uh, or they could work with the community to craft a compromise that the residents the council and the property owner could find acceptable so I wrote the song a long time ago and sold it to the Rolling Stones and the end of the lyrics is, you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. And I think with Valco, we may, everyone won't get what they want, but I think we could come to a compromise that would make everybody, uh, if not thrilled, at least satisfied. So crime has been an issue, and the big issue, who here has had their car window broken? Actually, not, not that many. Well... So every time I read the crime reports, um, I read about, I see the word laptop. So I would just, we cannot possibly hire enough police to stop this type of crime. Is, the, is Captain Urena here? I believe so. Captain, can you stand? <laughs> so I did meet with him in a task force a while back where they deploy a lot of uh, deputies to a location to try to um, catch the perpetrators of these crimes. It's really hard to catch. They move really fast. Sometimes you can see them break a window and can't even catch them in time. Um, there are not high-speed chases after them because that's very dangerous. So, and even if we caught them, I'm not sure what would happen. The state, as you know, with um, uh, Proposition 47, which was intended to reduce prison overcrowding, um, petty thefts may not result in the perpetrator actually going to prison even if they're caught, and we don't have that capacity to incarcerate them. So the short-term solution is for all of us to take some simple steps. Never leave anything of value visible in your car. 
Um, I tell this to people all the time, like passengers, you know, they, oh, I'm just going to leave my backpack. There's only dirty gym clothes in there. Well, the person looking in your car window doesn't know that that backpack has dirty gym clothes. They'll break your window just to check. <laughs> and my daughter in San Francisco says when she parks her car, the glove box is open and empty. The console is open and empty. Uh, if it's an SUV or a hatchback, the cargo cover is open with nothing there. Um, so they know that breaking in may not yield them anything and maybe they'll move on to the next car and doing all this thing, it's really a pain in the butt to always have to deal with this. But uh, we're a long way from achieving the root, from solving the root causes of this kind of crime. So in the meantime, we just have to be diligent. So commissions, we have a bunch of commissions in Cupertino. Um, yesterday, on uh, Monday and Tuesday nights, we had interviews for, the, for five commissions and committees. And the level of interest by the volunteers is always incredible. Uh, for several of the commissions, we had an excess of qualified candidates. It's, it's very hard to turn people down that want to volunteer in our city. You know, they're doing this on their own time, often significant time. Uh, to volunteer uh, and it's very really hard to pick people now each council member has their own priorities when they're voting for commission members and I think it's important for our commissions to be diverse in age in gender and ethnicity and I also I like to give opportunities to serve to new people to new applicants that haven't served on a commission before you know, often someone that's serving on one commission and is termed out will come back and apply for another commission. And sometimes that's great, but I kind of feel with all the demand of applicants to serve, we should try to give some new people a chance. And I think a couple of our commissions, we could actually legitimately expand them from five to seven members, um, as the, in the case of neighboring cities. So I'm going to go quickly through some commission accomplishments. Um, from last year, or from, from, yeah, from 2019. So bike ped, and we have some bike ped people here. Is Jennifer here? Great. Anyone else from bike ped? I can't see that far. Okay. So they put on community events like Earth Day, a family bike ride, bike to work day, the fall bike fest. They also advise on projects like Carmen Bridge and Regnart Creek Trail and the McClellan bike lanes. Our planning commission, who, is anyone here from planning? What? So they just had a meeting last night that went very late. Maybe they're all tired. So they did a lot. They contributed to business and tourism by adding uh, hotel stock where we uh, did GPAs to increase the number of hotel rooms. Uh, they amended the plan development chapter of the Muni Code. They implemented an SB 35 review procedure and checklist, which is extremely important. And they reviewed our general plan and the CDD work program. So our library commission, anyone here from library, stand up. You can stand, don't be shy. Rahul. So library commission aided in the recruitment of the new poet laureate. Um, they've been working on traffic and parking congestion information gathering and suggestions for how to solve this problem. Uh, and they uh, aided in the promotion of the patron survey. Parks and Rec, is anyone here from Parks and Rec? I saw some people, can you stand up? So the Parks and Rec master plan, this has been a long procedure and it's finally coming to council and uh, we hope to pass it, and we hope to find the money to implement it. I'm sure you've seen the empty ponds outside of Memorial Park for many years, and we really need to work on completing our Parks and Rec Master Plan. This, it's kind of an embarrassment when people see those empty concrete ponds there, and we, re we really need to get moving on this. They also put on summer events. Did anyone go to the camping? It was amazing. Um, it was over at Creekside Park, and I, happened to, I didn't even know about it, but I was walking through that park and all these tents going up and movies, it was oversubscribed, and 
really great events that we need to continue doing and expanding. They also did Bobatino, the Spelling Bee, Pizza and Politics, and the dog leash, the dog off-leash area. Has anyone walked their dog over at the Jollyman Park off-leash area? So I rode my bike over there a few months ago. It seems to be going really well. There's not been any incidents with dogs bothering people. The dogs are kept under voice control. And I hope that this pilot program can turn into something permanent and maybe expand to other parks as well. Now, my kids, we didn't have a dog. We used to go over to Eaton School, where it's kind of an unofficial off-leash area. And everybody loved it. I mean, the kids loved playing with the dogs, and the dogs loved it. But, you know, one complaint to the sheriff, and that gets shut down. So I think we need, hopefully, to have some more off-leash areas. Fine Arts, they're continuing the Artists Award programs, Distinguished Emerging and Young Artists, and the implementation of art in unexpected places. Our Teen Commission had the Wellness Carnival, the Hat Cupertino, Bo Bettino, spelled spell T-E-E-N here, and T-I-N-O in the other place, and Tobacco-Related Products Ordinance, and a Youth Civic Engagement Forum. Public safety, I'm not going to list all these, but they have done a lot of work. I really liked their help in July 4th fireworks, uh, HEP B awareness, Alert SCC, and the annual public safety forum, which, which I attended. Did anyone else here attend the public safety forum? It's really good. Don't, don't miss it next year. Maybe we have to advertise it more and, and have free, better free food to get more people to come. Our Housing Commission, they, reserved, they re reviewed applications for 428,000 in grant funds and they're working on homelessness issues and BMR linkage fees. And in the last meeting, we adopted their recommendations to the council. Sustainability, then an essay contest for middle school students. They hosted a forum on their zero waste home and they provided the recommendations to the council on the all electric reach code, which we passed um, last Tuesday with the second reading. And that's the biggest accomplishment, the REACH code. Um, you know, I know some people say, oh, it's going to be inconvenient for new houses to not have natural gas, but I think it's just something that we really have to do. I mean, we, we owe it to our future generations to reduce our re dependence on fossil fuels. Our technology commission, so they're working on 5G, smart city, the wireless master plan, they did the, tech set, the Teen Center Tech Refresh. They conducted an internet satisfaction survey, a cybersecurity presentation, and they judged the teen hackathon. Now, last night, we had the Tick Commission interviews. So one, one of the interviewees uh, couldn't make it. He was, he was in India. So we did his interview. He did a video interview. And we have to kind of update the questions because one of the questions they asked him was, are you familiar with DSL? <laughs> so I thought, well, that's a good question because if he does have DSL, we don't want him on the tick commission. <laughs> but uh, he actually handled that question really well, saying, well, that question may be a little outdated. Is, wait, is anyone here still on DSL? Maybe I better be careful what I say here. Okay. And so I talked about our bike ped commission. So, as you all know, our traffic congestion issue is a big problem for people, especially around schools. And we have to find ways that people feel safe riding their bike to school. And one of the ways to do this is to have more traffic calming because the police can't be everywhere all the time. So in just relying on enforcement doesn't, doesn't work. So I would like the Bike Ped Commission to be tasked with more than just bike ped, but also transportation issues. And they can work with our TIC Commission, our Public Safety, Sustainability, and Library Commissions. And it's one commission we really could expand to seven members and give them a lot more work to do. And they also are going to focus on additional infrastructure projects for, for bicycle and pedestrians. I think I already did tick commission um, and sustainability. Oh, because the buttons are going the wrong way. Okay. So we're back to 
opportunities and challenges. So we have a lot of challenges threatening our quality of life and they require constant attention. Our city finances are stable, but a little precarious. You know, if there's a recession, we have our homelessness issue that we have to address. It's increasing. Our traffic is worsening. Uh, the redevelopment of key areas of the city is needed. We have school, even though we don't handle schools, what we do affects the schools. Some of our schools are at capacity and, and students can't even register there. They have to go to schools outside their neighborhood. But, and other schools are under-enrolled. So we need to look at what we can do for balancing. I, you know, nobody wants to see schools closing, but I know CUSD has been looking into that because of some of these schools that are way under capacity, way, way under enrolled. And the state government in Sacramento, they're continuing to erode our ability to control our own destiny by them passing legislation that strips the city of our ability to control the zoning and character of our own town. Uh, there's legislative pending that would reduce or eliminate mitigation fees. Now, mitigation fees, they are set at levels far below what is necessary to actually fund the infrastructure. So we really need to be sure legislation that seeks to reduce those even further does not occur. And it's not just the city. There's also efforts to reduce the mitigation fees that are paid to schools by new development. So when a new development goes up and there's 500 more students all of a sudden, the schools need the money to increase the number of classrooms uh, and build new facilities. And if that gets taken away, uh, who is gonna backfill that money to the schools? I mean, we'd love for the state to do it, but that, that may not be forthcoming. But finally, despite all the issues, we have it really well here in Cupertino. You know, we should be thankful for that. You know, as we start the 2020s, we should think of what we can do, show kindness to our neighbors, strangers, friends, loved ones, and you know, even talk to someone you don't really like. You, know, <laughs> you talk to them, you may, you may still not like them at the end, but you'll find common ground, and you may understand what they're going through, because everyone may have things going on in their life that you just don't understand and don't know about. And I think, you know, we have great people in our city, great people make great cities, great cities are made of great people. And also, never hesitate to reach out to your elected officials. We're making every effort to get out in the community to meet with residents. This will continue in 2020. I am planning a series of community bike rides to explore our city. They won't be difficult. There's no 50 mile rides and we'll get feedback from residents. And it's okay to complain to us when you see something you need fixing or changing. But it, you know, compliments, you can direct to me. If you have a complaint, direct them to our Vice Mayor, Darcy Paul. <laughs> Dar Darcy, why don't you stand up and uh, so. Yeah, so Darcy's the focal point for any complaints you have. Uh, and so, I, that's all I have. I'd like to thank you all for coming and have a good evening. Enjoy the food. Make sure to get all your swag and uh, we will see you next year. And I'll be around if you have any uh, questions you wanna ask. Thank you.